Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Data Radio Show. I'm joined once again by Sam Williams, futurist, expert in all things AI, because I want to learn a little bit more about disruption. I think disruption is a really interesting term because to a lot of people it sounds like a really bad thing. But I think with something like AI, particularly generative AI as we see it now, it has a lot of potential to disrupt our world in a lot of really positive ways. And Sam, you've used the idea of this being almost as disruptive as the widespread adoption of electricity. Um, I know with the, the rollout of electricity, for example, to try and get people to adopt it, at least one elephant died in the process, um, being electrocuted to death to show just how powerful the other people's electricity could be isn't seen as dangerous. It was kind of a strange little twist. Are we looking at something like that for this sort of disruption around how we do things? Like, are we looking at that bigger impact really i i guess the the thing uh to take into account here is it's hard to imagine what life was like a hundred years ago so if we go back mm -hmm. to 1924 uh yeah you know a century ago electricity had been around for decades you know it, it was being used in things like uh the telegraph um system it was only a relatively recent phenomenon that you were starting to see domestic supply uh, of electricity. There's no one left alive today that has any memory of what life was like uh, in 1924. But what we can say with some certainty is that electricity supply was completely inconsistent um, from one place uh, to another. So you could live on one side of the street and get 240 volts DC supplied to you. Um, and your next door neighbor could be on a completely different electrical supply um, grid that was 110 volts AC. Uh, so there was no consistency in the use of electricity uh, 100 years ago. You know, if you, you sort of think about where we're at with generative AI. There are all sorts of different models. We're right at the beginning of being able to experiment with it. There are very few standards. There are very few regulations. You know, even, even dumb things like uh, the plugs and the sockets that we take for granted today didn't exist 100 years ago. So there was no standardization not only in terms of supply, but also in how you connect to the grid. And uh, this is really tough for us in the 21st century to imagine what life was like as a consequence of um, things being so different. You know, we take for granted um, the idea of being able to plug in a hairdryer, for instance, or, you know, uh, actually have a spark that lights a gas boiler. Uh, they were all things that didn't exist back then. What it did do though, was drive entirely new forms of infrastructure, entirely new forms of industries, and totally different levels of convenience and comfort. So, you know, as a talked about, uh, about sockets and uh, connection, you know, that infrastructure, you know, there was cabling that now we take for granted that's installed into every house. Um, those standardized outlets that we have, the, the transmission systems, the generation systems, the power companies, um, that whole infrastructure is something that was in its infancy a hundred years ago. So if you if you think in those terms, it's quite difficult to imagine what becomes possible as generative AI is infused into just about everything we do and everything that we rely upon. Um, so there are going to be entirely new industries um, generated as a consequence of um, Gen AI, uh, it's going to bring whole new levels of convenience and comfort 
uh, to our lives that very difficult to imagine what it's going to be like. But that example that I used earlier of um, how just that spark to be able to light a gas boiler was something that didn't exist a uh, hundred years ago and how that one thing is uh, revolutionized what becomes possible in terms of heating homes, driving all sorts of different things that utilize other forms of energy. Um, you know, electricity uh, or the, the discovery of electricity drove the telegram that uh, or the telegraph network and communications, but it also was the underpinning for radio, TV, and ultimately what has become the internet. So, yeah. I was going to say that there's a very famous picture from, I, th I think it's sort of the early 1900s of, of people predicting the future. And you've got people out uh, with their, their mobile phones or what we recognize as mobile phones, basically screen to screen recordings or talking to each other in the headphones and they're off doing walks and on devices and stuff like that. Um, in, in terms of where they were and the technology they had to how they see the future or saw what we would consider current day, how easy is it for us to see what things are going to be like in a hundred years time, considering we, we don't know the full impact of what this revolution is going to be like. I think the interesting thing about that is you need to impose, um, exponential growth onto mm -hmm. that equation. So we're going to see as much change in the next 10 years as we've probably seen in the last hundred. So when we, you know, think about what it's going to be like in a hundred years time, it's uh, it's exponentially more difficult to imagine than what we can imagine 10 years is going to be like. Um, so I think the time horizon is really the thing to um, actually bring back into focus. And it's, it's more um, pertinent to our lives uh, as well. Like it's very hard to imagine um, it's quite difficult to imagine what it's going to be like in 10 years time, but it's certainly mm. that much more difficult to, to conceive what a hundred years is going to be like. I, I guess the point of that is that right now, right here, um, at this moment, there's a whole world of opportunity uh, in front of us in terms of the possibilities for data and AI engineers and the context that um, I've found useful or the metaphor that I've found useful to uh, understand that is this idea of you know, electricity and what its effect has been over a hundred years. And it's actually not me that came up with that idea. It's um, Andrew Ng, you know, one of the, the foremost um, thought leaders in the AI space that talks in terms of how disruptive a generative AI is going to be relative to what we've experienced with electricity. I guess the thing with electricity is it's something that is easier for us to grasp what, mm. what life might be like without electricity, um, especially you if you're out in the lab. The <laughs> yes. yeah. Visit the museum, you can see what it was like there. Um, yeah. I suppose it's also for people who are looking at getting into this field or trying to work out you know, career moves, they're in a way pioneers. You know, They're standing on the edge of, of a very large precipice. What, what are they seeing over the horizon? Yeah, and I guess this brings us to the, the core of what we wanted to talk about today in terms of a presentation by Daryl Plummer um, at Gartner Symposium uh, back in late uh, 2023. And he talks in terms of the seven disruptions uh, that uh, you might not see coming. Um, so... We'll, we'll put a link to his presentation uh, down below. Uh, it's actually a fascinating and, and much more lengthy discussion than what we're going to go into. <laughs> um, but essentially, uh, there's some work that Gartner have done uh, in terms of 
trying to figure out the orders of magnitude of notable digital disruptions that there have been over the last couple of centuries or century and a half. Um, and much like orders of magnitude that you find uh, with earthquakes, um, it's a logarithmic scale. So at the, the most base level, for those who can't see the pictures that um, we're going to share with you, <laughs> um, you, you have some a level that just enhances our day-to-day -day life. Um, the second level up is extend um, what we're currently doing. Uh, the third is transform. The fourth is reinvent. And the fifth um, order of magnitude is revolutionize. And so to put that in context, you know, enhance is a low uh, impact. Uh, and a um, massive or revolutionary disruption is 10 to the power of five in terms of its effect. So to give you some simple examples of a low uh, impact um, digital disruption, that's um, client server computing or direct access storage, you know, uh, disk drives, for instance. Um, you know, smartphone navigation uh, is another low to moderate uh, impact. The assembly line manufacturing was another low to moderate uh, impact on our lives. If we skip to the other end of the scale without going through all of the examples that there are there, at the top, in terms of the most disruptive, somewhere between World War II and the internet uh, and the Industrial Revolution, uh, the, the first Industrial Revolution, that is, uh, the three most disruptive uh, events that there have been in human history to date. So we, we don't tend to think of what the impact of World War II was like, um, but it was huge in terms of an, an entire generation, or multiple generations, if you include World War I as part of all of that, were impacted by it. And it's hard for us to imagine today a world without the internet. For instance. So the key thing that um, uh, Gartner and Daryl Plummer were talking about is how generative AI has a particular impact. What, what is the impact of generative AI on our lives on this disruptive scale? And once again, uh, if we, we think in terms of you know, electricity supply. Today, in 2023, 2024, um, generative AI is uh, easily recognizable as being something quite transformative uh, in, in terms of what it's going to do. However, if we fast forward five years, so half of that 10-year scale that I was talking about before, uh, Gartner are arguing that um, generative AI is going to be at least as revolutionary as the Second World War. Um, so that gives us some sense of orders of magnitude of what's on over the horizon for at least the next five years and beyond. Um, you know, when I think about the stories I've heard about World War II, and how it impacted a generation. You know, my father was one of the soldiers that went off to war. Um, and it is a fundamentally disruptive thing that changed their attitudes forever. Uh, I think we're on the cusp of something that is going to change our attitudes, our life, uh, the infrastructure, the uh, industries, um, quite substantially, you know, as disruptive as something like the the internet or World War Two. With with this list of of disruptions, 
I'm, I'm kind of curious whether or not we can sort of look at things in hindsight and reassess where they go. Because I see something like assembly line manufacturing, for example, that, that's sort of in that low to moderate impact, the, the sort of extension of, of, of things. Um, but at the time, it was really revolutionary, sort of coming at the tail end of the industrial revolution. It felt like an extension of that a little bit. Nowadays, we're just kind of used to it because everything's automated. Do we see some of these things in hindsight as uh, having a slightly different impact now because we've got that benefit of hindsight? Yeah, look, I think the thing around um, the assembly line manufacturing is how fundamentally it changed the nature of work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Henry Ford is popularly known as the you know, father of assembly line manufacturing. What a lot of people don't necessarily know that um, Henry Ford was instrumental in and responsible for is the 40 hour work week. Mm. Um, back in uh, the early uh, 1900s, so around 1920, actually, I think it was, um, Henry Ford um, decided to actually pay workers more and ask them to work less. And this was the invention of the 40 hour work week, but it was also the invention of the five day work week. And part of his logic uh, in doing this is that he wanted to also create a market for his vehicles and to create a middle class that A, had the leisure time to be able to take road trips was something that was missing back then because people normally worked six days a week, something like 60 hours a week um, was standard and they were so exhausted by the time they got to Sunday, all they could do was go to church and that was it. So Saturdays are actually an invention of Henry Ford and the idea of um, uh, creating a burgeoning middle class that could actually afford um, to buy um, those vehicles he essentially created a market with that. Now, the whole point of mentioning that is that from a, a social norm standpoint, the 40 hour work week is something that is less than 100 years old or just mm. on 100 years old also. And I think that uh, generative AI is going to significantly change the concept of exchanging your time and effort for money, um, but in particular time for money. What we're going to see with the advent of um, AI driven industries and the application of AI in existing industries is there's going to be the requirement for you to work less and actually be able to do more things that have a greater impact. Uh, and so personally, I believe that we're going to see a shift from exchanging your time for money uh, to exchanging your impact for money. And that's one of the interesting possibilities that, that flows from generative AI that you're going to see unfold over the next decade or so. Um, there, there were a couple of other things that um, this uh, presentation talked to, uh, which is really relevant to uh, data and AI engineers in particular. And this is AI driven legacy code modernization. So there's a whole heap of legacy code out there that was built by programmers in COBOL and Fortran. Uh, and those programmers aren't around anymore. The, the systems themselves have never been gotten rid of because they just work and mm -hmm. why spend money if it's not broken. But there are uh, significant limitations to what you can do going forward with those code bases. And one of the possibilities with generative AI is that you're going to be able to dissect that code uh, and essentially um, rebuild it, modernize entire code bases 
um, to be able to uncover all sorts of new ways of doing things uh, in, a, in a robust fashion. So you're not using generative AI to replace what those systems do. You're using generative AI to re-engineer effectively what those systems were built to do. Um, and I, I kind of suggest that that's one big opportunity from a career standpoint in mm. terms of the coming years. You know, most of the, the Co COBOL and Fortran programmers that there are out there, it's a bit like finding Latin speakers. There aren't that <laughs> many of them um, and they're not that active. No, and I can imagine that there's going to be a lot of different applications like that out there though, that, that for people in this industry to be able to basically say, look, this is what's worked for years and we can still do that and we can improve on it because we've got this technology and we're learning exponentially more about it as we go along. It, it's, it, it is very much like standing on the precipice watching everything come racing towards you. Yeah, second thing that's going to drive um, the rise of generative AI in terms of how it's going to um, be revolutionary is, you know, it's not just about transformation or reinvention, it's, it's about this revolutionary um, capacity that it has it comes down to the pace of engineering innovation. Um, mm -hmm. And we touched upon this last week in terms of the ability to model and test um, different scenarios. And it, what, what you're seeing is the, the time to value is collapsing. And from an engineering standpoint, and, and if we just talk about coding and um, the idea of using agentive um, AI agents or um, AI agents to, to build code, to actually effectively build new forms of value. One of the areas that Gartner in particular are predicting is in the space of engineering innovation. And that's everything from uh, rocket science and rocket engineering mm -hmm to, as we talked about last week, um, health uh, and medicine. Uh, so to be able to, to model um, drug trials without actually having to use rodents is um, at, at least for the initial stages of figuring out the efficacy of a particular drug or um, a regime for a particular drug. The, the third area is around climate action and um, you know, reaching net zero carbon emissions uh, you know, and the models that we are able to now build and have built around the impact of temperature increases, reduction of carbon emissions and how it will affect temperatures and what flow on effects there will be. These are incredibly complex models to build mm -hmm. that used to take supercomputers um, to build. Now we're seeing the models emerge. Uh, like there is a digital twin of the earth. I think we talked about <clears throat> mm. yeah. I think we talked about that last week. Um, but circling back to you know the, the the rocket science or the rocket engineering side of things, you know, you're seeing um, the space race uh, emerge or space race 2.0. You know, this time round, it's not the USSR versus the USA. It's actually billionaires pitting their wits against other billionaires. From Jeff Bezos to Richard Branson um, <laughs> uh, and Elon Musk and everyone in between, you're seeing this Space Race 2.0, and in fact, SpaceX is one of the foremost leaders in this uh, uh, rocket engineering using data uh, and AI models. Uh, so a lot of the development of the SpaceX rocket ships is actually being deliberately driven to have rockets fail so that they could actually mm. understand and discover where they were going wrong. I guess just using those three examples of Space Race 2.0, health, medicine, and well-being, and climate action, 
there are three industries where there uh, you're going to see the emergence of what I would describe as being purpose-driven economics. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the fundamentals uh, of how business value is created based on things like selling time for money uh, is going to shift. And uh, this idea of purpose-driven economics is something that is going to be possible to be unlocked using generative AI. And I think that AI and data engineers have a profoundly important role to play uh, as, as things change around um, purpose-driven economics. Is that a field, if, if you're looking at something akin to today's society, that you'd be looking at influences at, you know, selling experiences and time and, and influence essentially? Yeah, I, I guess uh, some of the early forays into this is, are platform business models. And there are some good examples and bad examples of that. So uh, Airbnb is an example of a platform business model. LinkedIn is an, an example of a platform business model. And Uber is probably the most commonly um, touted example of a platform business model where uh, you know, convenience and com comfort are kind of on demand, but there is a darker side to some of this if you allow people to be exploited. You know, things like DoorDash, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the States and, and Uber Eats, um, you know, people are, are making barely subsistence livings out of those, those platforms. So, um, the reason I mention them is that it's not a utopian, um, everything is going to be perfect uh, outcome. You know, the, the, the clue that there lies in there is that how the economics of value creation are shifting. You know, what we value uh, is, is changing and uh, the economic models are going to evolve in response to that. And there are some good examples of early impact oriented um, platform business models. And there are uh, examples of others that haven't quite got the, the formula right in terms of this idea of a purpose driven economic model. You know, essentially Uber is still a, you know, uh, for profit, um, arguably exploitative model. Uh, and I think that there are opportunities using AI to change the dynamics there is essentially what I'm saying. Sounds like a good place to wrap things up. The future sounds very exciting. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I guess with every great disruption comes great opportunity. It's probably mm -hmm. the easiest way of putting it. I think it's a good time as well for people to look at what they can do to leverage that opportunity, knowing that it's coming really good time to start looking at, at, at maybe shifts in their careers or what they can do to upskill. Yeah. Uh, look, one of the, the examples that they use in the, the seven disruptions that you might not see coming, um, the rise of silver workers, mm. um, people of my age and, and above who have plenty of gray hair. Um, but, uh, are not economically, um, uh, well, uh, have more to offer than the traditional models of retirement at 65 or 67 or whatever the, the age is. So you're actually going to see those people that have um, a lot more experience become more active in um, deriving or creating value, leveraging generative AI. So I guess the easy way of putting this is it's not just an opportunity for a career change for a 20 something or a 30 something. Mm -hmm. It's actually driving career change opportunities for 50 something, 60 somethings, 70 somethings, 80 and 90 year olds. 
And as we discussed um, last week, you know, kids born today can have a reasonable expectation of living to 125. So that's another thing that's going to shift. You know, how long we actually deliver economic yeah. value rather than just receive economic value. Yeah, you know, I suppose if you're living to 125, you're spending more of your time not working if you're still retiring at 65, 67. You don't start working until you're sort of in your teens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, oh, it's a massive paradigm shift. Well, that's why when we, we talk about, you know, a 10-year time horizon or 100 mm. years, you know, it's very easy to imagine that in 100 years' time, um, you know, the idea of exchanging your time for money will be gone mm -hmm. completely. And, you know, if you, you think of some of the science fiction examples that you know, I'm at least across, you know, being a Trekkie, um, you know, in, in that future, you're, you're not trading your time for money. You know, it's all about service, at least the way that the, the stories so are the told. The Federation would like it. <laughs> yes. Well, and, you know, I guess it's purpose-driven economics mm. in a form. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, absolutely. We, we, we had to do a shout-out to science fiction. Oh, of course. Yes, that's actually what I'm doing for tomorrow is playing around with a little bit of science fiction stuff. So that should be lots of fun. All right, Sam, thank you very much for giving up your time again to give us a run-through on this one. Um, we'll make sure that there's links available in the description as well for people to be able to track down the presentation that you've been referencing so they can see where exactly everything fits in on the scale as well. I'm actually kind of surprised by things like where radio is, how it rates higher than antibiotics, but that's just me. You know, spent too much time in radio um don't forget to make sure you like share and subscribe with this video or podcast you can download it tell other people about it would be greatly appreciated and until next week have a great time and live long and prosper Bye.